Let's just look at what we have today on the agenda. First, we're gonna uh, have Leona King uh, talk about the data space uh, support center works. And then we are going to have uh, the data space for tourism come on stage, which will be followed by the work of data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities. Uh, then we will have the prep data space for mobility, explain their use cases. And finally, we will have the Green Deal, Green Deal data space uh, share their insights. Uh, each presentation will be 15 minutes, uh, and uh, as said, you will have time to ask your questions. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Leona King. She is a researcher at CITIP, uh, which is a research group at KU Leuven. Her research focuses on common European data spaces, in particular the legal frameworks and data governance mechanisms associated with such data infrastructures. So Leona, please come on stage. I will stop sharing so you can uh, share your screen. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me. Yeah, and yes, you have quite a packed agenda, so I'll keep it in brief. But thank you for the introduction. So as noted, I'm Leona King, and I'm a legal researcher at the Center of IT and IP Law in KU Leuven. And today I'm speaking on behalf of the Data Space Support Center. So I'd like to give you all a very warm welcome on behalf of the DSSE. And so today we're going to give you a brief kind of overview of data spaces and the governance frameworks that we're looking at and kind of exploring. So giving you an insight into the work that we're doing as part of the DSSC. So I think it's important just for the context as well. So um, to start, I think it's best to look at the European data strategy. So um, considering really the role that it has and what it means and how it's actually guiding us as well in our work in the DSSC. So the European data strategy, its real focus is trying to unleash the benefits of data sharing in Europe. And this is through a combination of the fit for purpose legislation, as well as governance to ensure data availability. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the fact that we have these kind of new horizontal legal frameworks coming in and being introduced in, for example, the Data Governance Act will um, be enforced very soon. But we also have the proposed Data Act, as well as the Implementing Act on High Value Data Sets. So we have this kind of growing legislative framework intended to support the governance of data and the data economy. And within that as well, we have common European data spaces. So common European data spaces, um, I thought they're best to kind of think of them in a functional way. So really um, what they're, they're intended to do. So rather than getting too focused on some of the definitions, I think it's nice to think about them in a functional way. So what these kind of data infrastructures are really meant to do. And they're really meant to operationalize this European data strategy. So they're intended to implement the vision of the single market for data in Europe. Um, and that includes this, this um, ensuring that data can flow within the EU and across sectors, as well as making sure that it adheres fully to EU values and rules. Um, and for that, we really need to have clear and trustworthy data governance mechanisms in place. So within the DSSC, this is something that we're exploring. So really the, the governance dimension to complement this um, data sharing infrastructure. So more on what the actual DSSE is doing and our work, um, we've already released this starter kit and a glossary, which hopefully many of you are already familiar with. Um, if so, then this graphic on the right-hand side, you'll be familiar with too. And also it's inspired by the work that's already been done by the OpenGI project. So we're really picking up on the, the building block model that they developed and trying to, trying to bring it further and advance it. And though we have this visual here on the right hand side, we're really working to develop a new visual that really um, positions governance in a much more elevated level and also unpacks it. So um, we feel as though governance wasn't kind of paid the attention it deserves in the kind of previous work done to date. We feel as though there's still a lot of work to be done. And this is really the focus of our work now in the DSSE. So we're making sure that the business governance and legal aspects are elevated and expanded. And we're doing that in cooperation with the rest of the community. And I'm very grateful to see so many familiar faces here today and some of the other panelists um, we've already had in our governance thematic group. Um, so by interacting with the community through this, through the various thematic groups that we've set up in the DSSC, as well as expert groups, we're really trying to incorporate the insights from the other projects and leverage the work that's being done on governance. I think today's um, webinar shows that there's a lot of interest in governance, so it's great for us to collaborate and leverage the work that we're doing. 
And this is really part of the DSSC in helping to coordinate this. So we're delighted to be involved today. Um, that's not forgetting that the governance is also very much related to the technical side too. So we are really exploring kind of the, the, the latest insights that are coming from the technical convergence um, kind of spearheaded by the Data Spaces Business Alliance as well. So on the kind of building blocks, we are going to hopefully have more information to share with you very soon. We're finalizing a document on our building block taxonomy. And then we have our 0.5 version of the blueprint that will be coming in September. And just to give you some more kind of information on what you can expect from this. So um, when I say that we're further developing the, 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 um, the business, the building block model, um, this is kind of currently the, the format that we're working with. So as you can see, we have really taken the kind of governance pillar and expanded it so that it actually incorporates elements such as business and legal. And we see that governance is very much interlinked with these other kind of aspects as well. So at the moment, you know that there's just kind of three building blocks there, but um, through the work that we're doing with the thematic group and expert groups and kind of a series of workshops, many of you may already have been involved. We're really trying to kind of unpack this and create kind of uniform components and units that will really help projects whenever they start designing data spaces. So we're unpacking this kind of business, legal and governance element and recognizing kind of the interrelations between these two. And despite the fact we see kind of a distinction made here between the green and the blue, we appreciate that the technical is very much relevant as well. It's to a certain extent, it really implements the kind of business governance and legal building blocks as well. So hopefully very soon you'll see in a more detailed version here where you actually have our building blocks named underneath in business governance and legal aspects as well. So going back to kind of more the focus of governance, um, what is governance in a data space? Well, for kind of a first place to start, we can look at the DSEC glossary. So there we defined um, governance as the creation, development, maintenance and enforcement of a governance framework. But this then begs the question, what is a, a governance framework? For that, we also have a definition and it refers to the set of principles, standards, kind of policies, which can refer to rules and regulations, as well as practices that define how a data space is governed and the decisions that are made. And it then introduces this role of the data space authority as well. So as I've already kind of identified today, governance is multifaceted and it includes these kind of business, operational and legal aspects, as well as setting requirements for the kind of tech technical architecture of the data space too. But based on this, it still doesn't give us a, a very clear kind of understanding of exactly what governance is. It kind of alludes to some of the elements, but we think we kind of need a structure to, to further explore this. So this links to the work that we're doing in terms of the building blocks um, in trying to give more structure to, to governance. But before we do that, we almost have to take a step back to really kind of appreciate the full picture of governance. And so this is the output of one of the activities that we did in a, in a workshop in, in the governance thematic group. So there we had um, various projects and initiatives represented. And we really did a brainstorm on what is governance and what can fall under this somewhat umbrella term. Um, it's great to know that it's so broad and expansive. And we can see some really interesting kind of points raised from kind of more social um, and ethical considerations to um, different kind of relationships, such as private and public interaction. So we start to kind of identify some reoccurring elements that keep coming up, but governance is extremely expansive. So based on this, we've been trying to, to break this down and cluster it so that it's more structured because um, working with governance as such a broad kind of term um, means that it's very difficult for us to actually functioning work with it. So one of the key things that we've been doing is identifying these kind of clusters almost. So we start with considering the roles and responsibilities. And um, you'll note in this kind of word cloud that certain roles continuously come up. And again, some of these are going to be coming from legislation as well. We can think of data altruism organizations, you know, more data intermediaries. But then we also have the dimension on the kind of data layer in terms of the, the data governance framework. We identify this as another kind of key aspect. And then to frame more the kind of processes and decision making, we're also seeing this as a, a kind of a cornerstone that's coming out of the governance. So for the moment, we're kind of exploring these different clusters, but very much focusing on the content, because I think you'll see today as well, we can frame things with different titles, but really we need to take the opportunity to discuss with one another what these really mean. And I'm really excited that the different use cases will be extremely valuable for that too. 
So this is just an overview. Um, you'll note that there's some other aspects that can come under the, the governance framework, but this just gives you kind of a sneak preview to some of the work that we're, we're doing and the different framing that we can have for governance. Um, but I'm very hopeful that the use cases today will give us greater insight. And for those of you that are interested, um, we often have presentations in our governance thematic group. So if you're working on governance and are interested in kind of sharing more about your work, please feel free to reach out. And I think I've just about kept within the time. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you very much, Leona. You were right on time. Um, you have one question from Jose Maria Veganzones. More or less there with the name. The question is the technical building blocks are available, uh, are they? Yes, we have snippets on the platform. So if you bear with me, I'll pull them up and put it in the chat in the meantime. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for introducing the valuable work that the Data Space Support Center is doing. For those of you who are not familiar with the Data Space Support Center, which uh, I'm sure you are with by now, uh, they act as a central node uh, for all the sectorial data spaces. So the work that they are doing is very valuable for all the sectorial data spaces. Uh, those are the ones that are actually are going to present right now. That said, we can move on to our second speaker, Eric Paul, who is here to represent DATES, the European Data Space for Tourism. Eric Paul is the chair of a new governance, which is a nonprofit based in Brussels. Um, their goal is to uh, ensure more trusted and fair, to create more uh, trusted and fair data infrastructures to ensure serenity over data, as opposed to other areas in the world. Uh, but they often work together with uh, the European Commission and the Parliament, the OECD and the World Trade Organization or the World Economic Forum. Uh, Eric, please uh, come on stage and share your screen with us. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sophie. Mm. All right, you you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for organizing uh, this uh, this event. Um, so, um, a new governance is is part of of dates. Dates is a is the CSA for tourism, and it's made up of companies from tourism, the tourism industry, and uh, and data. And that's very important to have both. Uh, working uh, working together uh, when we when we start to talk about tourism uh, you, you, certainly you have those those pictures in mind but what's important is actually that uh, well when you look at those figures like uh, 27 million in jobs direct and indirect or 10.3 percent of the eu gdp it means that really it's a major eu industry which well may be surprising for for some but when we say 10.3% of the EU GDP, in comparison, the automotive sector in Europe is 7% of the GDP. Uh, but there's actually another figure I want to point to you, and it's this one, the 745 million. Uh, this represents the, the international tourist arrivals uh, in Europe, which is, well, 50% of the global market. And why I like this figure is that if we manage to have just two acts of data sharing per incoming uh, visitor, we will have 1.5 billion uh, sharings of, uh, of data, which, which would already make some, uh, some scale. Um, why tourism really needs a data space? Because it's a, it's a really specific uh, sector. We have many, many uh, interactions between, well, human talent and human talent, maybe well, like, like here, uh, the, the talent of the, of the, of, of the barman, uh, but it, it can be also obviously uh, museums, activities, etc., um, and obviously skills uh, that are that are important to make this uh, this industry work. But also climate, uh, so the, all, all the weather forecast, finances, transport, all the tourism destinations, and and OASC uh, or, or Euro cities obviously are are, uh, are important uh, factors in uh, in there. But also another one, which is which is here at the at the right hand side of my of my uh, screen, and that's the feelings of the of the tourist, the 
publications, the, the picture that it's taking, etc. This is obviously uh, interesting, but it's interesting only if it's done in a fair and trustworthy way. We don't want our feelings to be shared with with others, etc. Just maybe uh, that it creates a, it, it creates a, a profile. So really, a, a very wide uh, typology of uh, of actors and, and sources of information. So really, clearly, uh, tourism needs a needs a, a data space. But the, so the, the the question here uh, is well, which governance framework do we do we need so well you're all familiar uh, with the notion of, of rule book so we, we we want to 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 lay the foundations for a rule book for uh, a tourism data space um, and uh, leona you you spoke about the the new uh, eu data laws uh, which are which are coming and we 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 come up with a, what, this uh, this pyramid with the eu level bodies where the the main question is well how do we ensure that uh, data sharing governance delivers the expected results and i remind you that one of the uh, the objectives of the data strategy is to create a level playing field to ensure that it's not just a big platform that that benefits but also the the small players um that can be um SME startups etc uh, really benefit from it and in tourism 75% of uh, companies are uh, SMEs and very small companies. At member state, well, it, it's how do we implement this, uh, this the, the data sharing governance on a national level, and maybe also how do we uh, incentivize uh, public and private sector to to go into data sharing? And if we if we look at ourselves as data space initiatives, the main question is well, how how do we govern ourselves, and why do we how do we govern ourselves? It's not just a matter of law regulation uh, decisions etc it's also well what do we want to do as a data space and in our case it's clearly how do we innovate well we want to innovate and grow and 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 have this innovation and growth for all types and sizes of uh, of uh, actors in a trustworthy uh, framework but to do this obviously we are, we are quite helped because we have all, all the, the elements that come from the EU level, from the member state level, and also technical level, which can come from, well, the, the standards of GAIA-X, IDSA, or, or, or soon the, the EDICS, and then the, the uh, Tourism Data Space Rulebook. And what is, what is nice is that obviously the first three levels are common to all data spaces, which should, is uh, interoperability. But also one, one, one point is that we don't want to to create a big monolith, uh, and and we are we are aware that there are more regional initiatives, more local initiatives, etc., that need to to be aggregated uh, to to create really um, uh, a federation of uh, of systems. So we 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 have defined what what we call sub tourism data space, uh, um, and those when they write their rule books will have to take into account the four rule books that are uh, that are above so um when we when we look at and and it may shock um, a few of you but when we talk about the the rule book for the tourism sector and i guess that it's the case in other industries it is first and foremost about tourism not about data sharing what are the objectives of, of the industry what what do consumers and, and customers all companies want to achieve and then data sharing is a tool that is going to to build um to build this and in a, in um in europe we have and and in tourism we have the, the good fortune to have many uh, actors involved in in data sharing and those are just a selection of uh, of european uh, associations in charge of uh, of tourism we have next door which is one of the member of the consortium but we have others which may be uh, very interesting uh, for and, and who will probably come up with interesting uh, use cases for instance we have here the european network of accessible tourism if you have uh, accessibility problems in your in your life well uh, the fact that you don't have to to input the same information uh, all the time may be uh, interesting obviously uh, interesting we have also the the youth hostel association and i think it's important because uh, clearly those guys are born uh, digital so it may be it may be um, interesting but you take any icon any any logo you 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 liaise it with a, with another and you have potentially um 
a use case or several uh, use cases. So if we push the, the logic uh, further, tourism data space governance starts also um, at uh, well with a, with a tourism sector uh, governance. So we don't need to reinvent the, the wheel. We, we have already existing bodies in the tourism sector, existing guidelines and policies, existing standards, both in the tourism sector and in the data sharing sector. So what we need to, to do is to create, uh, to create our, our rule book is really to identify the gap and try to, to, to close it. So um, another pyramid, uh, I guess that because we're, we're uh, a CSA on tourism, we like, uh, we like pyramids. It makes us think of, uh, of Egypt, but uh, more seriously, uh, on this pyramid, well, you see the, the three levels and also the, the, the sectoral approach. And our governance framework needs to take into account what we call the hard law, and this is what uh, Leona has spoken about, but also the soft law, which is more the bottom-up uh, approach. And all those three uh, sectors will enable us to uh, to write uh, our, our rule book, which take all the, the 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 elements from from every level. Um, if you if you if you need uh, the presentation, I think uh, will be uh, available after um, afterwards. Um, so I won't uh, go too much into into detail because we well we we favor uh, questions and uh, and discussions. But so there's the, the the first pillar, which is the rule book, but there is also what we call the role book, the role, who does what, who decides on, on what. And in, in our opinion, this is going to really strengthen uh, the, the governance, both at um, uh, data space level, but also at uh, European level, so that there are no gaps, no overlaps, and that things are very clear that when you want to, to create a data space, you can virtually press a button and you know exactly who does what and, and what who has done what so that you don't have to, to reinvent the, the wheel. And, and here are obviously um, a few other things that um, our uh, governance will need to will need to, to do. Um, we, we are working on this with, uh, with Citra at the moment. And uh, after the summer, we will publish a document on the on the holistic European data governance at EU level, member state level, and um, and uh, and data space level. But obviously, for data space, what were the work we're going to to well, we are doing with dates, uh, it will be published uh, before beforehand. Um, so, in terms of of, um, of 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 tourism data space, there's one question that we ask ourselves is, and and that we think we we need to ask ourselves is about the legal structure. Shall it? have a legal structure or not. And then the three main items that need to be touched upon are, are well, obviously organizational agreements, operational agreements, how does it work? And business agreements, how do we automate uh, links so that it's not, oh, we need to, to create an API, et cetera. No, it's data sharing. So it needs to be uh, uh, almost at the, at the touch of the button that you can, that you can do uh, something. So, the way we, we see it is that our governance should be made up of well, some of the European tourism associations that you that you saw uh, on the previous uh, on the previous uh, slide, but also uh, representatives of the data spaces which are which are um, upcoming, and it should have also a coordinator. This coordinator would work with the EDIB. Uh, but also with the data space support organization. So currently the DSSC, but we don't know how the, the at the end of the 36 month project of the DSSC, we don't know how it will be called. So this is why we've been a bit, uh, a bit, uh, a bit larger. And then we will create this holistic and adaptive tourism data space rulebook. Adaptative in our, in, in our opinion is very important because yes, technology is, is important, but it's a tool. And also technology will evolve even though the, the well, and the industry will create new services, but we, we have several uh, uh, technologies. W an, another point that is important for our coordinator uh, for, for this um, rule book, sorry, is that 
it will feed into the tourism ecosystem who will be able to innovate to create new uh, new services using this rule book with, which will be uh, uh, empowered or, or boosted by the rule book and eventually this will have an impact on the leisure and business uh, travelers that we are we are all but obviously, especially in, in tourism, there are interfaces with a lot of other data spaces, mobility, skills and jobs, finance, health, green deal, and many others, energy, et cetera. So we need to have also, this is why we, we, we think we need this, uh, this coordinating role, how it's going to be, to be done well. It will have to be, um, to be decided. After all, we, we're just a CSA laying the, the, the ground, but there's, there's a huge need for, for coordination. Um, in terms of practical dimensions, well, you won't be surprised by what's in the middle because that's that's what uh, uh, we have been discussing with the uh, data space support center, et cetera, and, and, uh, and the ecosystem. I would like now just to, to touch on two points, which are the, 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 the dark blue. The purpose, we need to define for the tourism data space what the purpose is so that we have like the spirit of the of the law, you could uh, you could say those are our, our objectives. So that when technology, when new players uh, enter, etc., uh, we can still refer to to it to to make sure that we are on the on the right path. But at the same time, it needs to be adaptive. So at the end of the day, we need to audit what we are doing, clearly, but also uh, adapt our governance to to changing uh, situations, technologies and maybe obviously uh, regulations well in in a nutshell uh, this is uh, this is what we are about uh, you will have on the slide the, the the website of the of the csa as well as well uh, the the contact details of both project coordinator work package lead and uh, and of myself voila so thank you eric uh, very much for the presentation about the governance work being done in the context of the data space for tourism. And uh, thank you for just reinforcing the thought that uh, we are not here to reinvent the wheel, but in all these data spaces, we are working uh, towards also understanding the ecosystem and understanding the good practices that are already out there and to build on existing knowledge. So I assume that everyone who is here in this webinar is also here to do the same. So we are very appreciative of that. And we are here to also share this knowledge with you. So if you have any other questions following the, the, the webinar, please do reach out to us. That said, uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Justine Gagnon who is from EuroCities. Uh, Justine is also a dear colleague of mine. We work together on the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities preparatory action. She's leading the work uh, on governance. She actually um, moved to Brussels and joined EuroCities uh, recently. And she's working on projects related to digital transformation, digital literacy, and smart cities. Uh, please, Justine, come online. And yes. share no problem. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Thank you. But we can't see the, the yeah. screen. I'm sharing it right now. No worries. And um, Okay, hi everyone, uh, and thank you for attending the webinar. I'm really happy to contribute uh, to this uh, webinar and share the thoughts uh, we had on the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities. So DS for SSCC. You can see on the slide all the partner organizations that are involved in the project. As Sophie has said, um, um, working with your cities and I'm involved more specifically on War Package 2, which is really looking at um, the possible ways of governing the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities. So I really uh, enjoy Eric's presentation. I think there are many overlaps. I will take a more um, bottom-up approach, but I think uh, we will find similar um, questions and, and similar um, findings emerging. Just to put the ds 4 ssc in context, so it's not only um, the governance work that we're doing, so developing a governance schema, but also um, 
there's a build, uh, technical uh, work package led by the Fire Foundation. We have already published a catalog of specification, and uh, soon we will publish a reference architecture and cookbook. And there's also a, a work that is being done on identifying um, priority data sets and, and creating a roadmap to implement um, the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities. So very much uh, embedded within a broader context and all of it, the first blueprint will be published in September, as I believe a lot of us have to do. Uh, so in terms of the governance, um, we started um, around bringing together relevant uh, stakeholders and uh, looking a bit on the demand side, so cities and communities and supply side. So we have other uh, stakeholders, including uh, academia, the private sector, wide range of private sector actors, as well as um, civil society organization, NGOs, etc. And we decided to focus the work um, from first the point of view of cities, because they're already grounded in a local context and local ecosystem, and see how they interact with these other type of stakeholders. So for example, private sector with B2G data sharing, um, collaboration with academia, collaboration with citizen science, etc. So everything that involves multi-stakeholder kind of data exchange and trying really to capture all these ecosystem worked and what we could uh, draw as lessons for the governance scheme of the data space for smart communities because these data space are really grounded in local context and need to benefit cities and communities and then we really need to scale them up and connect them together with other data spaces um, as well as with other uh, ecosystem um, in local context. So it's quite a, a big complex picture that is emerging. And we decided to focus on use cases, mapping uh, exactly who were the stakeholders that were involved in each of the use cases using this quadruple elix. So as I say, academia, private sector, public sector, and um, civil society. But also mapping uh, quite precisely the different data sets that uh, were uh, exchanged and shared, and the, the data flow from which direction they were going, et cetera, what were the enablers, what were the challenges. And interestingly, and I think that was really part of the governance aspect is also mapping the different types of exchanges between stakeholders, because we often focus on the data, but actually other aspects are really, really important, like knowledge exchange, legal support, data skills, um, different type of data service provider, data intermediaries, citizen involvement. And all of this is really uh, governance. Uh, so obviously it's very connected to the, um, the flow of data itself, but it's also important to have this uh, other layer that is more organized organizational and systemic in, 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 um, in mind. So we've, we've done some, some mapping and we collaborated with um, different cities uh, on what they were doing already in, in you know, sharing data with different type of stakeholder. And we um, created a, a work program. So here is quite quickly the, the timeline we had. We focused on two uh, type of use cases, one that was more related to mobility and how to manage traffic management to reduce air pollution and, 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 and congestion in, in cities. And the second one was around energy and how to um, anticipate the potential of pa solar panel in on public uh, rooftop um, in deprived area and how that could help citizens to um, decrease their uh, energy bill. And as you can see here, um, in terms of participants, we have quite a large numbers of cities as listed here at the bottom. And then we have a broader forum with all stakeholders, including um, the supply demand, so academia, private sector, and civil society organization. What was interesting, and I, I will uh, speak to this data canvas a, a bit uh, later on uh, when I will present the data, uh, the data use cases, but here is like throughout the work we've done with cities, um, they, especially Amsterdam City Council, but they all thought it would be nice to have a tool to kind of encompass those governance aspects, and you will find um, different aspect that has been raised by Eric already. But here they kind of um, divided the com compass into three uh, broad um, scope or three broad like um, columns. So the first one is why, and it's really about the scope, the context, and what exactly are the benefits of the data cooperation. So this you can see is the one in the middle. Then on the left hand side is really focusing around the question of governance. They call it organizational. It's a co-development exercise. So the, the, the language might change slightly, but the, the conversations um, are, are quite in line with what we've just seen. So really um, organizational aspect of governance, the business case, the incentives, the mapping of the stakeholders, um, the rules, 
and what is shared, what is not shared, and how it is implemented. And then on the right hand side is more the technical aspect that is being developed in collaboration with package three um, at the moment. So it's still, still very much a work in progress, as you can see, and I'm happy to share uh, the slides afterwards. Um, but I thought it would be really interesting to just uh, explore this using um, a specific example and, and a use case. I have two, but I might not have time for two. But anyway, I will start with, uh, with Amsterdam um, and the use cases that really um, was at the start of developing this data cooperation canvas. Um, so it was, um, it still is, <laughs> the Amsterdam Intelligence Data Exchange Alliance. So basically it's an alliance between uh, Amsterdam city, the Hague city, but also region. So the, the North province of the Netherlands, as as well as national um, transport authorities. And they have come together to um, basically create um, a data exchange to improve data on uh, roadworks. So the context is that basically Amsterdam um, has data on the planned roadwork. So they have a um, time period when they know that there will be roadwork on a specific uh, street, but they don't know exactly when this um, roadworks will take place because often it's outsourced by a third party that is actually conducting the roadworks. Um, so what's it was interesting was, well, we could use this data that we have, so it's public sector data around planned roadworks and really uh, add to it or like aggregate it, combine it with a floating car data, which is pub, uh, private sector data to really um, cross um, check what was actually happening on the road. So that was really this uh, willingness to create this partnership. So as you can see um, here, I'm going to explain this. So the, on the left-hand side, you really have the four first partners. So the city of The Hague, city of Amsterdam. Um, in the middle is the National uh, Transport uh, Agency. I'm not going to try to say it because I don't speak Dutch. Uh, and then the, the province of North Holland. And um, they first send all the data to the, the National Data Access Point. And the National Data Access Point made it open access to other private sector actors. But basically they realized that none of these private sector actors were using the data because it wasn't of um, good quality enough and reliable enough for them to use it. So they decided, to stop doing that and they create they collaborated with um, a startup that really helped them to improve the data quality of the public sector data and then using also uh, private sector data to aggregate it together to create value and then send it back into the loop and what was interesting is that um, the private sector companies can also give feedback to the uh, to startups that is um, improving the data quality uh, over time and also directly to the cities and, and um, national bodies. And also interestingly, and for sustainability of this project, the, past, uh, the, the startup that is at the moment helping with the data quality, developing algorithm to aggregate the private sector data with the public sector data is going to transfer all this technology to the NDW, which is a national data access point. And that's a public sector body. So this will become part of the national data access point and therefore sustainable. Uh, so you can see here, and I'm not going to get into detail, but basically what we've done is using the data con cooperation canvas to really map these use cases in terms of governance model, in terms of what are the shared processes, what are the stakeholders, the incentive, the context. Um, so really doing a lot of work on, on the mapping, um, which I will uh, take uh, to throw and, and, um, and expand it to uh, the governance of the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities. Um, I'm just going to skip that one. But also what's important is the benefits of this data collaboration between the private and public sector. So obviously there's better quality of traffic data for all sides, so from the local authorities that they know <laughs> globally when the roads are shut for um, roadworks, and they can also check on sub subcontractors, basically, which they couldn't before, but also is better um, data for navigation service providers, such as Waze or um, Google Map or etc. Um, to uh, help their user to know in advance that there will be roadworks on, um, on a specific uh, street. And obviously it reduces also tra traffic disruption and air pollution and um, accelerate the sh shift to a smart and sustainable uh, mobility. 
I will quickly run through the second example because I think I'm running out of time. But basically, it's a similar process we've done um, using the use cases in Barcelona around energy communities. And here you can see at the bottom the different uh, partners that were involved. So a startup is called Impacti the data science um, um, department at the University of Barcelona, Acciona, which is an energy supplier and a, quite a big large corporation, and uh, city, uh, Barcelona City Council. So they developed together a tool to access, to assess, sorry, the maximum um, surplus of solar energy from municipal buildings and public sp spaces in relation to the spending of the household in a situation of energy poverty. They use a mix of public and private sector data, as you can see in the table here on the bottom. And uh, basically, the, the purpose of this is to help families that are um, in situation of energy poverty by redirecting some of this energy uh, created by um, solar panel on the public uh, building roof and, and, and decreasing their um, bills. Again, we've done a similar um, mapping and I think that's very important that this is the same structure so we can see the communalities and the differences and, and um, really start like drawing those, those lessons and, and what we can take a level further for the, the governance of the data space for smart and sustainable communities. So here again, I will share the slides you can have. Um, um, a look at the details of the, the two use cases. And here is the um, rendering of the tools that uh, Barcelona is now using. So is here, as you can see, is the maximum potential. And here is actually they have identified the, the cases where it's really beneficial for the communities in these three neighborhoods to um, have solar panel in the vicinity. So I think I've said here the benefits. So uh, obviously, um, helping uh, decision making in time of energy transition, also uh, the transition to clean, affordable and secure energy and the reduction of energy poverty. Um, and I want just to finish on the, the lesson for the data space um, for smart and sustainable cities and community governance, but I guess more generally for the lessons around governance of data spaces. So we, what I'm hearing often and um, it, it can be B2G, so business to government data sharing, but also when academia is involved or where citizen um, science is involved, it's really identifying win-win situations. Um, legislation is a possible stick, it's possible and useful in some cases, and putting data sharing um, obligation clauses in public procurement, for example, is, is a solution that is really helping. Uh, however, it's always better to find mutual incentives to collaborate. So it's, it's really about identifying what is in, in it for each of the stakeholders. What's also very important is to start from use cases and existing needs. So we have lots of, and it was the same with Smart Cities Project, a lot, lot of um, diagram and, and, and um, ambitions, but really what we need is like what do we need on the ground and what will be the actual benefits of this data sharing starting from there building the trust and then scaling up um, what i hear also a lot um, is really the importance of defining defining role and responsibility so i'm really happy that the dss uh, the data spaces support center is, is looking at that and as well as eric um, that has just uh, put forward some of it um, really, we need to know what are the different rules in these data spaces, but also what are the different rules for the stakeholders. So, for, for example, if you're a private sector co um, corporation, you might not have exactly the same rule if you're a public body, as if you're in academia, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really um, important to make that clear from the outset. Finally, the importance of intermediary organization, especially when it comes to business to um, governance data sharing so this could be academia it could also be a non-for-profit organization or just data intermediaries are a, a very good way of um, ensuring or like fostering trust between stakeholders that don't necessarily trust each other or when there is a competition um, there are competitors for example uh, e-soft um, mobility providers that are catering for the same city, they might not want to uh, share the data with the city, but if there is a, a third party or an intermediary organization, this can really help um, with um, 
the, the ensuring um, trust in this in this ecosystem and the role of uh, knowledge and best practice sharing as we're doing here as part of the CSX community, but I think it also applies as, as part of the data space uh, community. So there is really a role for a community orchestrator. There might be a space also for a repository of good practices. So um, really people don't start from scratch and, and there is a way of um, replicating things that have been done and proven to work in specific context. So that, that's all for me. This is uh, my contact. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat or just to ask at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justine, uh, for this very interesting uh, use cases, both of them. Um, you received some questions in the chat, uh, but before we go there, I just want to announce to everyone that uh, all presentations will be shared with the participants Yep. Okay. When you registered, we got your email address, so we will circulate all the content. Um, okay, so some of the questions are, and also there will be a link to recording. Yes, everything will be made available. So let's go from the first question. Uh, curious to know the main tech suppliers and how these tech providers view data spaces, uh, the idea of data spaces. Is there any pushback legal issues on the horizon already? from Tiak Timan. Uh, yeah, okay. This, yeah, that's a very interesting um, question. And I think that's why we have the stakeholder forum in the, in the project is really to bring also the, the supply side. And um, overall, I don't think there's a pushback. I think actually uh, uh, the people on the supply side, they really, really want to um, answer and, and uh, make sure that the solutions they develop actually um, answer the needs of the cities. And, and, and usually there is a, a need to share data really to um, further the public good, but also there's a good business model for it, for the business um, perspective and the technology companies. So I think that it's not like antagonistic and it's really, as uh, I was saying, identifying win-win situation. Uh, in terms of the legislation, um, Again, some of the legislation can be uh, useful, but I would uh, put the emphasis more on collaboration and, and what uh, we can do without necessarily like bringing the stick first. Thank you. Uh, then we had uh, some questions about uh, the, the generality of the governance model. Is it use case specific or uh, can it be, um, so do you have to do it for every uh, use case or can it be for all use cases? Martin Reichert. So that's what um, is very interesting with the data cooperation canvas, which uh, we will um, adapt to be um, a structure for the governance um, of the data space. It is uh, eventually um, use case specific just because these ecosystems are grounded in um, local context. So as uh, also Eric was saying, it's about the scope. And often the scope is, is um, connected to the national legislation, to the relations that are already existing in local context, to um, whether or not the energy company, for example, is a public utility or, the, or a private utility. So it's really related to context but at the same time because it's structured in a similar way you can really learn um, the different elements from different use cases that would work um, for your own situation uh, and i think in that way it's, it's quite um, useful the next question is uh, again from uh, tiak timan what is the business model for data in intermediaries Whew, that's a good, uh, good question. Uh, I think I can't necessarily reply to all of it. What I said from the um, city's point of view, so um, cities, sometimes they don't have necessarily the capacity. We know that they have a funding issue. Uh, they don't necessarily have the skills. So they're quite happy if they trust the data intermediary to have a model, for example, of software as a service um, or like space, just whatever as a service, infrastructure as a service, et cetera, if they, if they know that um, you know, it's trustworthy, can, it's interoperable and it's auditable. So I think they're quite happy to, to have that, to add them, um, make the most of the data they have or make the most of business to govern data sharing. Uh, I'm sure there will be other business models, um, but that's the one I see uh, from, from kind of the city's perspective. Uh, there were some questions regarding the use cases. How do you get involved in the use cases? How do you propose a new use case? And we also got a specific question about the use case in Saragossa. 
um, which yeah. would be later uh, answer to Daniel Jimenez. Yeah, yeah, so Sarkosa is, a, is part of the, the group um, we're discussing with, and there are lots of interesting use cases. At some point, we need to, we needed to make a decision <laughs> on, on which one uh, to put forward. Uh, but I'm always interested in hearing about uh, use cases, uh, and I know that Sarkosa is doing a lot of work on um, logistics and, and et cetera. And when it comes, what was the first question? Yeah, getting involved, um, bringing use cases forward. I think actually Sophie would be the, the contact point because um, the following up of the data space for smart communities preparatory action, which will end um, in on the 1st of October when we will publish uh, the blueprint, uh, is the deployment call and there will be a call for projects etc so basically the my advice is stay tuned uh, attend the stakeholder forum and uh, be in touch with sophie she will <laughs> she will know uh, what's coming up thank you justine and thank you for the presentation there are some more questions for you in the chat but i suggest that we move on so that we will have time for the next two uh, data spaces as well so next up we have a uh, charlotte uh, I hope I, I maybe she, you can you can repeat your last name. I'm Charlotte not... Ducan. I'm very much used to people not being able to pronounce my name, so you just call me Charlotte. That's really fine. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Sorry about that. So Charlotte is here joining us on behalf of Prep Data Space for Mobility. She's a doctoral researcher in law at CITIP, Kau Leuven. So she's actually a colleague of Leona. Um, and she's questioning whether EU data legislation can establish data markets while at the same time keeping the balance with European values. So please, uh, Charlotte, take the stage and explain us about the Prep Data Space for Mobility. Um, you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Yes, not on full screen though yet. Here's it no, fine no. now. Perfect. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I really liked, I take the opportunity to say that I really liked uh, the previous presentation. So it was very interesting for me to hear. Uh, my perspective though is a little bit different. I really take a regulatory perspective. Um, so my question is, if we take the mobility sector in particular, what are the specificities from a regulatory perspective? Uh, and I want to look at it um, kind of, oops, yes, kind of both ways. So on the one hand, uh, the question is, what is, how is mobility um, specific concerning data and data regulation compared to other sectors and potential data spaces? On the other way around, I think it's interesting to look at mobility from the perspective of how mobility as a sector and mobility datafication as a history, what can it teach to, maybe to other data spaces or other data sharing um, and data processing situations? So I will just try to throw a few pointers there. Um, so yeah, my, my first point is, the specificities of mobility concerning data and data regulation. So those specificities, they, they stem from the specificities of mobility as a sector. So first, is mobility really specific as a sector? The thing is, mobility is not a sector. Uh, we, we know that with data spaces, it's not easy to draw boundaries of what's in, what's out. Uh, it's particularly the case with mobility. Uh, mobility, actually is comprised of different transport modes. Um, this is something everybody will know, but of course they are subject to various governance models that are very much influenced by the law, um, especially in the EU because of the EU project that kind of comes on top of the national layers. Um, we have uh, a very important imbrication of public and private actors and sectors. But also this imbrication is differentiated. It's not the same in all the sectors. Uh, one of the very important elements is the liberalization process that has been uh, really driven by the EU. So I have, uh, I'm a railway person <laughs> deep in my heart. So um, if you look at aviation and the railways, aviation is a little bit international driven, driven so it's a little bit different. Uh, but if you look at those two, obviously liberalization has come up with a lot of legislations 
uh, that are very much based on EU law. So of course they're implemented in national legislation. So there is some form of harmonization, but it's also very much mode specific, but also um, local specific. So it means um, national legislation can actually diverge. Uh, you can also have this multi-level governance um, difference that we that we see in a lot of um, um, of such modes. Um, an important element here is so within, especially within the liberalization context, still you do have public service obligations. So we had them before the liberalization process. We still have them now that such sectors are liberalized, um, but they have a different form. So they, let's say they constitute a form of lex specialis compared to market and market regulation. Um, also very important, we have a distinction between long distance and urban transports that are um, within several uh, transport modes. Uh, so this is the divergent side. So the idea that mobility is actually not a one single thing. Uh, this being, we have also elements of cover convergence. Uh, and here, I think what is important to bear in mind is that mobility, as put in mobility data space, is actually the one project that datafication and digitalization is expect are expected to deliver on. I think it's very important to understand. I really liked what Eric earlier said. Uh, that what is important is not data sharing, is tourism. In this case, it's mobility. What data sharing is expected to deliver is obviously local. It depends. So here, the project is really to build mobility. Um, so I refer on my slide to I, the ITS directive, which I think is also related to what Justin said earlier. If I she didn't refer to it, but I kind of guess that it plays a role in the use case that she referred to. So the ITS directive is a directive that dates back from uh, 2010, but it says essentially that uh, the European Commission should have um, powers to uh, lay down data sharing obligations for a number of uh, mobility related um, use cases. It really starts from road transport as a key entry point, but the idea is that we bring together different transport modes via the data layer, so to speak. Uh, now there is um, a revision on the way, um, but the idea is really to ease smart mobility and so on and so forth. So um, another element that I think is really bringing uh, the different transport modes together um, is the importance of the infrastructure. Uh, so historically, we have the physical infrastructure that's clear, and now we have to take into account the digital infrastructure that comes on top as well. Uh, that comes with a number of implications. So first, the, the, well, I'm not looking into economics right now, but obviously infrastructure means very often public funding, uh, which is an element that is very often present, uh, present in mobility. Uh, this also means that transport is local, so transport data are also local. Uh, and finally, but only a pointer again, uh, infrastructure, although it does not necessarily mean networks in the, in the case of mobility, infrastructure and networks are very closely collected. So it means we have network effects at the level of physical infrastructure and potentially at the level of the digital infrastructure as well. Uh, another element that you could consider as an element of convergence between the different uh, transport modes and anything that you refer to with mobility is the fact that um, some actors are actually in between public and private logics. Uh, so here I have to refer to my own experience uh, as an in-house lawyer in the railways before. So I was working for the Belgium um, Railway Infrastructure Manager and there the liberalization process was so that, so in Belgium, this is InfraBel, so a public undertaking, meaning that you have a semi-private, semi-public legal regime, together with public funding, together with a lot of obligations, together with legal monopoly for certain activities, together with a legal obligation to try and make money. So this is a bundle of things that you have to find your way in. And then comes the data layer that actually reinforces this, um, let's say, uncomfortable position between the public and the private logic. So I recently uh, conducted a study for uh, RNE, so RealNet Europe, that is 
the um, gathering of um, national national railway infrastructure managers in order to facilitate international rail, international railway traffic, and they were really inquiring about how do we go about the data that we that we do have in store what can we do with such data can we monetize them can we not and so on and so forth so i conducted this study as part of CTIP, so my, my research center together with my colleagues um orion de and ali kib and Mayo. so i'd like to also thank them for their work but really one of the things was that it's not an easy thing for someone like Irene or others who do have very interesting data but they have very contradictory obligations. So on the legal context, it's not an easy thing to do to have on the one hand an incentive or even an obligation to share data, to make them available for further reuse, la, la, la. and on the other hand, to have confidentiality obligations because you are uh, in a business uh, context. So you have confidentiality obligations vis-a-vis -vis your customers, but on the other way around, you have obligations to make data available for uh, further reuse. Um, another element here is that I think the liberalization process plays a very significant role in the data environment. So this is an element that was demonstrated by Montero and Finger. They show that liberalization leads to fragmentation of actors and activities, especially in a network context, and it creates interfaces and therefore interfaces because of communication between the, uh, different actors creates data. I think that's an interesting element that we have a lot of operational data uh, in the context of liberalized industry. So finally, very obviously, uh, transport is often safety critical, which, play, which plays a role on, on data, data sharing, data quality expectations, and so on. So that was the first thing that I wanted to do. So I wanted to just give a few pointers to the specificities of mobility vis-a-vis -vis other contexts, other sectors. The second thing is um, now looking kind of the other way around, what mobility and mobility datafication can teach to the, the overall process, but also potentially to other data spaces and, and context. Uh, I wanted to make a point, as you will see, again, you can, you can feel the railway taste very much. Um, so the um, transport sector, mobility, if you will, is uh, very much uh, characterized by interoperability, and again, it's particularly a result of liberalization, but also the need for safety. So in, um, liberalization, as I said, created fragmentation of economic operations. So you actually need uh, tools and processes to uh, make those different entities work together. And interoperability, broadly said, is about this. Um, it used to be that, um, especially in aviation and the railways, it used to be that you had one incumbent operator. So you don't need interoperability if you, are, if you have one incumbent operator, one integrated incumbent. Well, you need interoperability if you have uh, different actors. So then as a matter of law, I think something that is quite interesting in how interoperability has been imposed by law is that it's, at least in the railways, it's been um, designed as a community building exercise. So um, Maybe some of you have heard of TAP and TAF TSI, so uh, technical um, specifications for interoperability concerning um, the passenger uh, and respectively the, the freight um, telematic applications. So here the idea of the, the law, so based on EU uh, railway law, was to design uh, a community of stakeholders, so both railway stakeholders and semi-railway stakeholders, if you will, such as uh, ticket vendors. The idea is to mandatorily bring them together so that they have to come up with the standards. And then in an iterative manner, the legislator then um, brings those standards in law by changing the law. So this is very much of an iterative process that has been on for many years now. Uh, what does it teach us, in my view? Um, first, that the co-regulatory approach, especially to standard making and interoperability is uh, very far from new. Railways is only one off. Uh, secondly, um, this is a long-term endeavor. This does not come um, at the touch of a, of a, of a click. Uh, and thirdly, there is very much of an insider-outsider phenomenon, which is that, of course, those are those which are within the community, they can take part in startup making, while those who are not uh, 
gone, so it's it's more it's more costly for them to adapt. Uh, what we can see here, more specifically to to the um, the transport area, is that um, well, this whole interoperability endeavor um, has been very much model specific. So now the problem, especially with data exchange, is that um, it might be a break to intermodal interoperability. Um, so TAF and TAF TSI are typical example of, of really like data sharing relevant um, standard making processes, but are very much railway specific. So now other iterations are expected to um, to ease that, uh, but that's something that I think we should keep in mind when designing uh, data related interoperability measures. Finally, the last thing that I wanted to say, so I'll be actually quite quick if I have a good count of time, um, is the, um, the relationship between um, infrastructure and platforms and the role of datafication therein. So again, I'm, I'm referring to the work of Montero and Finger. What they showed, not only in uh, the transport sectors, but also more generally in network industries, is that when there is external datafication, namely datafication from actors who are not from that sector, there is a risk of what they call platformization. So legacy players might be platformed by external players who are active only in the data layer, because the data layer can be used to actually restructure and re-intermediate um, the sector. Um, and I think an important point, which has to be borne in mind based on the previous slides that I um, presented is that it's not only a market problem, it's not only a matter of internalizing the value of data, it's also because you have infrastructure, so you have public funding issues. So you might have a public value that is um, going outside of the sector through this uh, platformization phenomenon. Uh, and this risk might be reinforced by what I call the data as infrastructure motto. So this idea that because data is an infrastructure, there should be obligations to share them because it's good, because it can be reused at no cost. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you apply this to um, mobility, especially in case of infrastructure and public funding, then you, you reinforce this very risk. I would say I view this as, a, as an illustration of a more general argument, the data is always local, which I think has been kind of said a few times here already in, in various shapes. Um, so what do we do about this? Um, in my view, it challenges the sole regulatory focus on data with the implicit idea that data is a resource that could be um, dealt with as such. So what does it mean exactly then positively in terms of positive solutions? Maybe we, in some cases, we need to have uh, integrated regulation of value chains, maybe. That's something that's been discussed in the context of uh, smart mobility players. Um, also, I just wanted to point to, I think, an interesting research that is going on on both, actually on both sides of the Atlantic, so both in the US and here in Europe, that um, that's why I actually call it from infrastructure to platform and back that uh, there is also the discussion that maybe online platforms or some of them are also infrastructural in a way. So it means that they deliver on services or services that are of general interest for society, meaning in a defensive manner that society relies, necessarily relies on some of them. Uh, if you go down that path, that means that you may want to regulate them in a way that is kind of um, analogized to this of network industries and infrastructure as we know them notably in the, in the transport sectors. Um, so these are the, the few pointers that I wanted to make on a very general uh, perspective, I would say. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. These are a few references. So on the one hand, references of my own work, either alone or jointly with colleagues, and then of other uh, sources that are referred to in this presentation. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you for providing us with uh, so many references that we can review uh, that uh, refer to existing legal work pertaining to governance. Also, uh, some of the participants uh, added some links in the chat. You can uh, maybe review them. And uh, we can then move on to our next speaker. 
So Sergio Cinerella, who is here uh, represent on behalf of the CNR Institute, which is a multidisciplinary research uh, institute. He's there and uh, looking at the atmospheric pollution research. But today he's here because he's providing us with a use case uh, in the context of the great, great uh, data space, which is the data space focusing on Green Deal. So it's similarly to the DS for SSCC, it's a cross-disciplinary data uh, space. Sergio, please come online and share your screen. Thank you. You can uh, see my screen? Yeah, no, thank you. Some... Thank you, Sophie, thank you. Uh, all right, I'm Sergio Cinirella, uh, a senior researcher at the Institute of Atmospheric Pollution, uh, since a long time uh, involved uh, in the uh, building of this uh, uh, global observation system for Mercury, the GUSFORM. I will uh, tell you more uh, later. So, which is the, the context? Um, the GUSFORM. Um, was uh, um, was selected as a use case in a grid project. Uh, the grid project is uh, aimed to establish the Green Deal Data Space Foundation uh, and its community of practice, uh, which is of course uh, uh, which will be built on uh, the European Green Deal and the EU Data Strategy Strategy for Data. So uh, to, build, to build this community, um, GUS4M was selected as a, a use case among others. Um, GUS4M uh, was one of them uh, and is uh, the most mature use case. Uh, please let me introduce uh, the group on Earth observation to which uh, the GUS4M uh, which, uh, uh, participate because uh, GUS4M is a flagship of this, uh, this group. What is uh, the group, uh, the GEO, Group on Earth Observation? Uh, GEO is uh, an intergovernmental organization with more than uh, 1,000 members uh, and, and more than 1,000 participating organizations. A lot of uh, uh, Earth observation data, uh, a lot of uh, data providers, um, a number of uh, work program activities. Um, it is of course committed, of, not really of course, but it is committed to improve the availability and access uh, uh, use of earth observation in benefit, uh, for benefit, for the benefit of the society. The GEO program, uh, is organized in uh, activities. So uh, to implement uh, the uh, work program, a number of flagship uh, have been selected uh, as of the maturity. Uh, there are a number of initiative, uh, pilot, uh, uh, geopilot initiative. Uh, the maturity uh, grow uh, from uh, initiative, uh, pilot initiative to, uh, to flagship. Uh, on top of this, uh, there are regional geos that uh, are aimed to push the activity at uh, Kauskus level. Uh, so the flagship actually uh, are um, five. Uh, GUS4M is one of them and uh, is aimed to, uh, to build the global observation system for Mercury. But uh, which is the context of the GUS4M? The context of the GUS4M is uh, a political context uh, because, as you know, uh, there are a number of international conventions to which uh, countries uh, are participating. Uh, the one on, on Mercury, the Minamata Convention of Mercury is one of them. Uh, and the GUS4M is aimed to support the implementation of this, uh, this uh, convention. So uh, 
it is aimed to provide uh, a data set, of course, on uh, mercury uh, on mercury in the atmosphere. Uh, data should be comparable, should be harmonized, and uh, all regional existing network at uh, regional level uh, should be um, interlinked. Um, the Goose Forum uh, should provide, but, but now it, it is providing a, a knowledge hub that integrates uh, Earth observation data, uh, modeling tools, uh, and this uh, uh, is for co-design and uh, assess the implementation of the um, convention. So, uh, the effectiveness evaluation uh, of the convention, that means how policy uh, are acting at the environmental level, uh, can be evaluated through uh, a knowledge hub. Which are the key aspects of the um, uh, Goose Forum? Uh, the key aspect of the knowledge hub that uh, we are building is uh, uh, that uh, this is an integrated multimodal and multi-domain computational platform. Uh, it is based on an emulator. I will explain more uh, later on this, uh, but this emulator can provide uh, scientific-based information for policymakers. This is a very important, a very important topic. Uh, of course, we share data, we share programming components, uh, and uh, the end user, the decision maker, the policy maker can uh, act uh, as, uh, as its own um, uh, to uh, assess and to analyze uh, the uh, possible scenario. So the uh, Knowledge Hub uh, has a, a data value chain because uh, is, uh, is built on top of uh, data production. So we collect observation, uh, we run uh, chemical mathematical models and we provide uh, output of models which are uh, models that are very, very complex and cannot be run uh, on the web. Uh, we provide QA, QC for, uh, for uh, our information. All information is cataloged and uh, um, published uh, through a, a platform. Uh, so uh, at the end, uh, from a scientific data, uh, we provide knowledge to policymakers. So um, the process, the workflow, uh, brings uh, data, scientific data, from the uh, uh, collectors to the uh, end users. It is not simple uh, as a process because uh, uh, several things uh, uh, should be done before. So, in few words, uh, uh, very simple uh, because I don't, I do not uh, uh, enter in details. Um, we um, archive uh, data that are uh, QA, QC, uh, and they uh, pertain to uh, monitoring station, as you can see in this uh, slide. Uh, we have done a lot of monitoring campaign uh, along uh, uh, marine cruises, uh, along uh, aircraft cruises uh, uh, in the world. So all data are available, but uh, these data are not useful for a policymaker because uh, uh, you can, of course, uh, uh, understand how is going trend of mercury in the atmosphere in somewhere, but uh, this data is not useful for uh, uh, assessing uh, the implementation of the convention. To do this, uh, you have to run models. Uh, that ingest a lot of uh, information uh, from ranging from satellite information to uh, campaign, etc. So uh, the data we collect are ingested by the model for calibration, for validation, etc. At the end, uh, we produce a scenario. So uh, 
One scenario is, for example, how much uh, uh, is uh, the reduction of mercury in one region, for example, uh, Southeast Asia, if we uh, reduce uh, mercury emission in uh, North America. So this is an example of uh, one scenario. Of course, uh, everything because of the uh, chemical uh, behavior of, uh, of mercury, uh, the key point uh, for the analysis is the biota, because uh, at the end, uh, mercury, mercury is harmful, uh, harmful uh, to humans uh, only by ingesting uh, uh, seafood, fish. Um, so uh, the concentration of mercury in biota is a key point for our evaluation. The Knowledge Hub has actually a, a number of, uh, of components. Each one uh, is aimed to, to uh, give uh, uh, information on something. So a, a user can, uh, for example, um, browse uh, emission uh, data by countries and by indus industrial sector, uh, can browse a download data set, uh, and then can uh, do uh, a self-assessment for the region of interest. So uh, by moving uh, slides, uh, he can uh, uh, try to, to understand how mercury abutment can impact uh, another region. Uh, changes in the position and partners are, are, uh, are provided. Uh, of course, mercury impacts not only lands, but also may and mainly oceans, uh, giving a trend of concentration in oceans. Uh, we have, uh, uh, because of uh, a scenario uh, where provided, are provided only for atmosphere, we linked a biogeochemical model to the uh, Mercury, uh, mercury model output. So at the end, uh, a user can have uh, a flower, let's say, can have a flower on how uh, mercury concentration impact an abutment, can impact uh, marine biota. This is not uh, the end of the uh, knowledge hub because uh, uh, it is, uh, it is very uh, important uh, to provide uh, the cost uh, um, of abutment of a technology because uh, uh, to achieve uh, a given uh, abutment, a, a given uh, reduction in, uh, to the risk, uh, there is a need uh, to uh, evaluate the cost of such measure. measure. Um, a, a component of the knowledge hub uh, is providing uh, uh, the cost of abutment. Um, the knowledge hub, the goose for m sorry, um, is not only an infrastructure, is uh, um, a, is, uh, is really a, a link between uh, between partners. So actually, uh, we established uh, governing bodies. Uh, we are uh, 21 partners. Uh, we have uh, one co-chair, three co-chairs, uh, a focal point for each uh, region. Uh, and uh, uh, everyone uh, that is interested uh, to participate to GUS4M uh, can submit uh, a membership agreement uh, in which uh, uh, data policy, data participation to the uh, governing body is, uh, is um, described. Um, we are uh, developing uh, the last component of the Knowledge Hub, that is uh, the Human Health Risk Module. Uh, which will uh, evaluate the exposure to mercury in the food chain. And at the end of the fish uh, we eat uh, uh, every day or somewhere or uh, once a day, once per week uh, in some other uh, region. 
Sergio, uh, just a heads up that we have two minutes left of the webinar. Yeah, I, I finished. Uh, oh. So, um, the Goose Forum has a sustainability uh, perspective because we are participating to the uh, IRENE research infrastructure, that is an S3 infrastructure. But I want uh, to, to, uh, to point out that uh, uh, environmental data in the near future will be uh, uh, linked, uh, will interact with uh, health data. So um, there are a number of issues that should be considered, considered uh, ethic, ethical, legal, and social issue, data governance in terms of licensing and sustainability, but mainly of, uh, uh, among others, uh, the science policy interaction because data before, uh, before publishing should be uh, formally approved. So thank you and sorry to have taken much, much time. Oh, you were on time. Thank you so much. Just together with the questions, we were uh, swimming to keep up with the time limits. But thank you very much for all the, all the speakers of today. I think uh, this was a very holistic uh, review of all the governance work being done in different sectors and across the sectors. Uh, for questions, please do reach out to us. Uh, I understand there was maybe not sufficient time allocated for Q&A, but we are here to answer questions. So feel free to reach out. We will uh, put you in touch with the relevant uh, experts. I would like to thank everyone for their participation. A special thanks for Enol, from colleagues from Enol, uh, Giacomo Lozzi and Misha Gonzalez-Torres for putting this together and for your wonderful organizational skills. Um, and for, for hosting this. Um, I wish everyone a wonderful day. And for any questions, as said, please get in touch. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.